This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. This episode has particularly graphic descriptions of bodily harm and murder of both adults and children, so please take care when listening. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors, such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors, or authors, are of their opinion, and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Paul Z. You are listening to The Branch Davidians, Part 6. In this, the final episode of this particular group, we will be looking at the tragic loss of life and the end of David and his closest followers. Before we return to Waco, I just quickly want to tell you about an incident that happened a few months before. In August of 1992, there was an 11-day standoff between the ATF and the Weaver family, which is now commonly known as the Ruby Ridge incident. Former U.S. Army combat engineer Randy Weaver had moved his wife and children to a remote cabin in Idaho. He and his wife were very religious and wanted to stay in a place that was away from mainstream civilization so that they could live a life that they chose. There were allegations that Randy had attended meetings with the Aryan Nation and that he was holding illegal firearms. An informant for the ATF had purchased illegal sword-off shotguns from Randy and gave him up to the ATF. They in turn wanted Randy to inform on the Aryans for them but he refused, stating that he did not believe as they did and would also not give up the name of the person who had sold the illegal weapons to him. When Randy filed to appear in court, an arrest warrant was issued and the U.S. Marshal Services entered the property. The family dog alerted the family to an outside presence and a shootout ensued. There was a standoff between the Weavers and law enforcement during which Randy's son Sammy, who was 14, and Randy's wife Vicky, were shot and killed. And Deputy U.S. Marshal William Francis Deegan also lost his life. Weaver eventually turned himself over, but the people in the U.S. were outraged. They felt that if the government could do that to this family, then how were their freedoms and rights being protected in their own homes? The ATF had received very bad publicity around this incident, especially the hostage rescue team, or HRT, who was led by Commander Richard Rogers. This also led to the government looking into how these kind of situations needed to be approached, but it would not be a long time before the next one would happen. Back in Waco, David and his followers, who had believed that the Ruby Ridge incident was a sign that the end of the times were coming, had been reinforced in this belief when they realized that they were being watched by law enforcement. Special Agent Aguilera wrote an official affidavit which was then used along with some other documents to obtain a warrant 
to search the compound for the alleged stockpile of illegal weapons. In this, he included his findings of all of the parts that had been shipped to the magbag address, as well as witness accounts from ex-followers around sexual abuse and the weapons that they could recall that were at the compound while they were there. The paperwork was officially filed on 25 February 1993, citing the violation of Title 18 and 26 of the United States Code Section 9220 and 5845F. Title 19, Section 9220 states, quote, Except as provided in paragraph 2, it shall be unlawful for any person to transfer or possess a machine gun. And Title 26, Section 5845F states, quote, The term destructive device means 1. Any explosive, incendiary, or poisonous gas, A. Bomb, B. Grenade, C. Rocket, having a propellant charge of more than 4 ounces, D. Missile having an explosive or incendiary charge of more than one quarter ounce. E. A mine or F. Similar device. 2. Any type of weapon by whatever name known which will or which may be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive or other propellant. The barrel or barrels of which have a bore more of one half inch diameter except a shotgun or shotgun shell, which the secretary finds is generally recognized as particularly suitable for sporting purposes. And three, any combination of parts, either designed or intended for use in converting any device into a destructive device, as defined in subparagraphs 1 and 2, and from which a destructive device may readily be assembled. The term destructive device shall not include any device which is neither designed nor redesigned for use as a weapon. Any device, although originally designed for use as a weapon, which is redesigned for use as signaling, pyrotechnic, line of throwing, safety or similar devices, surplus ordnance sold, loaned or given to the Secretary of the Army pursuant to the provisions of the section 76842, 7685, or 7686 of Title 10, United States Code, or any other device which the Secretary finds is not likely to be used as a weapon, or is an antique, or is a rifle of which the owner intends to use solely for sporting purposes. The ATF then enlisted the help of the military to train them for the raid. The thing is, according to all of the accounts that I could find, The military only helps out when there are drugs involved. I read the entire affidavit and I found only one reference to drugs, but it was related to a man who associated with David and not about drugs on the compound. The only other reference to drug-related items on the compound was back in 1988, when David had won back Mount Carmel and found a meth lab on the property, which he had gotten local law enforcement to remove. The ATF had planned to serve the search warrant on 1 March 1993, but they had to quickly change their plans. The Waco Tribune had created a multi-publication series on David Koresh, called The Sinful Messiah. They had been asked to delay the publishing for a few weeks. The newspaper, however, decided to go ahead and publish the first article on 27 February 1993. The ATF subsequently changed their date to 28 February 1993 and alerted some television news channels about what they were about to do. There is a lot of speculation that they had done this in order to fix their negative image by having a successful raid broadcast on the news. On the morning of Sunday 28 February 1993, 91 ATF agents geared up to go and serve the warrant and raid the compound. In an effort to stay hidden until the very last second, they piled into the back of cattle trailers and set off to Mount Carmel. That same morning, Robert Rodriguez enters the compound. His plan is to suss out if David knows anything about the impending raid by using the news article. Paul Fatter, one of the followers who did the majority of his work with Magbag, had loaded a stockpile of guns, ammunition, 
and other paraphernalia into his car and left Mount Carmel that morning to go to a gun show in Houston. Around the same time, a KWTX reporter in a news van flagged down a passing postal worker. He was lost and he had asked for directions to Mount Carmel. The postal worker gave him directions and then he hurried off. You see, that postal worker was David Jones, David Koresh's brother-in-law, and he immediately headed for the compound as quickly as he could to warn them. While David and Robert were sitting having a conversation, Jones ran in and told him that he had a phone call. At first, David said that he should take a message, but then the follower said something that grabbed his attention. So David excused himself and went to take the call. Jones filled David in on what he had seen and heard on the road. When David returned, he said to Robert, quote, Neither the ATF or the National Guard will ever get me. They got me once, and they will never get me again. They are coming. The time has come. End quote. Robert made up an excuse and left the property as quickly as he could, trying not to arouse too much suspicion. When he returned to the house across the street, he immediately contacted his superiors, warning them that David knew that they were coming, but it was too late. David had then told the woman to take the children to their rooms. Forty minutes later, the ATF arrived at the compound. They had tasked the National Army Guard to fly three helicopters in circles at the back of the ranch in order to draw the attention of the inhabitants away from the front where they were entering. One of the agents went up to the front door, warrant in hand, but, by his own account, the man slammed the door and gunfire erupted from within. One of the survivors explained what she had witnessed that day. She said in an interview, quote, I saw a truck come in, and it was a very long thing, and then the second truck stopped, barely stopped, and then a man jumped out, in all kinds of whatever gear it was that he had on and he had a gun in his hand, and he says, OK, boys. Then I hear a voice to the right of me downstairs. I could tell someone was at the door. Then I heard a voice on the outside, and then I heard another voice inside, and then I heard shots outside. End quote. To this day, there is a lot of contention around who actually fired the first shot. The ATF maintains that the first shot came from within the compound and others claim that the ATF fired the first shot. David had gone to the door, but when he saw the agents, instead of going out, he ran back inside and hid. The thing is, the arrest warrant was only for David. I think if he had cooperated, none of the next terrible days would unfold. But again, in my opinion, being the narcissist that I believe he was, he would never give himself up to save his followers. Regardless of the circumstances, a two-hour-long shootout ensued. Douglas Wayne Martin immediately ran to the office and called 911. That was the clip that you heard at the start of the episode. Some members of the ATF team placed ladders against the building in an attempt to enter through the second-story window to get to David's room where they believed the guns were being kept. As they tried to enter through the windows, they were met with gunfire. FBI negotiators were brought in, and they immediately started talking to David. David had been shot through his side, but he was still okay. There are varying accounts on how long the shootout lasted, but it seems like it might have been around the two-hour mark. They eventually called a ceasefire from both sides. In the initial gunfire, four ATF agents, Steve Willis, Robert Williams, Todd McKinnon, and Conway Charles LeBleau lost their lives, and 16 more agents were wounded. Five Branch Davidians, Winston Blake, Peter Ghent, Peter Hipsman, J. Dean Wendell, and Perry Jones, David's father-in-law, also lost their lives. During the ceasefire, the ATF agents were able to remove their dead and wounded from the property. The FBI offered medical assistance to the Branch Davidians, but David refused it. Six hours after the ceasefire, Michael Schroeder, who had been away from the compound at the time of the raid, attempted to get back in as his family was there. 
In his attempt to get back to the building, he was shot and killed by ATF agents who alleged that he had been shooting at them with a pistol while trying to gain entry. Peter Gent's body was also found near the water tower, where it was said that he had been fixing it at the time. It looked like he had been shot from above, but the trajectory could never be confirmed. As federal agents had been killed during the raid, the FBI took command of the scene. Jeff Jamar was the site commander, and the HRT was headed by Commander Richard Rogers, the very same agent who had served at Ruby Ridge. For the remainder of the 51-day-long standoff between law enforcement and those living on the compound, the negotiators would mostly speak with David Koresh and Steve Schneider. Insiders noted that David had proclaimed that this was the sign that the fifth seal of Revelation was about to be broken. I read the revelation to you in the last episode. It's about the Lamb and the witnesses that were waiting for their fellow Christians to come to them. He, and especially his followers, believed that this was the end of time's fight that he had been preaching about. They firmly believed that they would be those who would need to die to make up the number of servants in the aforementioned scripture. The FBI negotiators had their work cut out for them. They were used to negotiating with criminal types, but to this point had not encountered a religious group. There was a huge amount of misunderstanding on both parts as they just did not speak the same language. Frustrated, the FBI continued to talk with him and tried to negotiate at least the release of the children at the compound. Again there was a lot of back and forth, but David eventually agreed, and 19 children were released over a two-day period. These were Angelica and Crystal Sonobi, Renee and Nahara Fagan, London, Tamara, Joannessa and Patty and Wendell, Scott, Kristen and Jacob Mab, Brian Schroeder, Jamie, Kimberly and Daniel Martin, Joshua Sylvia, Natalie Nobrega and Joanne Vega. None of these were David's biological children. A short time later, Kevin and Heather Jones were also sent out, which brought the total of children to be saved from the compound to 21. During the initial stages of the negotiations, the telephone line to the compound was still open and media were able to get hold of David and he gave interviews to them during the standoff. When the FBI got wind of this, they didn't want any of their negotiations to go pear-shaped by outside influences and they made it so that only one phone line could reach directly to them. When David realized that this had happened, he demanded that the line be reopened or else the government would be responsible for the death of the children still inside. The FBI negotiators asked David if he and his followers had any plans to take their own lives. He said they did not. After hours of back and forth on the phone, David finally agreed that he and his followers would leave the compound if the FBI would release one of his sermons on the seven seals to the media and that they would play it. The FBI agreed, and a day or two later, around 1pm, the hour-long sermon was played on CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. When the time came for David to fulfill his side of the deal, he told the FBI that God had given him instruction to wait, and that he could do nothing further until he received additional instruction from God. Over the next few days, negotiators tried to drive a wedge between Steve and David, but as Steve was completely devoted to David, it did not work. Videotapes were exchanged between the two parties. The Davidians had recorded themselves stating that they were there of their own free will, and the FBI sent in tapes pleading with them to come out peacefully. The FBI even played messages from family members on the outside trying to get them to come out. Now before you shake your head at the followers, let's think back to their beliefs. Firstly, they all firmly believed that David was the Messiah. Secondly, they had been preparing to confront the perceived enemy and even die for their cause. So it stands to reason that they stayed where they were, as what was happening around them solidified everything that they believed in. I'm not saying that this was in any way right. I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. Another thought that I had on this 
around the reason why he would even fathom keeping his biological children inside of the compound with him, knowing that he was surrounded by armed law enforcement, maybe that he was using them as sort of a shield. My opinion is that he may have thought that as long as there were still children at the compound, no one would shoot at them. This was solidified in my mind, when during a conversation between the FBI and David on 7 March, David stated during a request to release more children that, quote, you're dealing with my biological children now, end quote. When the negotiator asked why he would say that, he said that that's what it had come down to. It kind of makes you a little sick to your stomach. Another thing to remember is that David had predicted way back in 1985 that the final showdown between good and evil would happen in 1995, but it seems like, at least to them, it had come two years early. On the 9th of March, in an effort to increase pressure on the group to come out, all of the electricity to the compound was cut at 2.15am. This action did not have the desired response. In fact, David and Steve refused to speak to the FBI until the electricity was restored. March is springtime in Texas, and according to CurrentResults.com, the daily maximum temperatures average between 66 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 19 to 22 degrees Celsius, and the minimum averages between 45 and 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is between 7 and 11 degrees Celsius. Not having electricity could be pretty uncomfortable for those within the compound. By 9.45 a.m., the electricity was restored. Later that day, the group hung a sheet outside of one of the windows with the words, God help us, we want the press, painted on it. David at one point requested that milk be brought in for the children within the compound. This request was granted. Milk was sent into the compound. What the Davidians didn't know was that the FBI had planted bugs in the milk crates so that they could listen into what was being said within the compound. On 12 March, Kathy Schroeder and Oliver Gaiafas left the compound. On that same day, the electricity was cut off again, but this time they didn't switch it back on. Cracks started to show within the FBI. There was one side who still firmly believed that they could resolve the issue through negotiations, but the other side was losing patience and wanted to use more forceful tactics to get them out. The other side won, and on the evening of 14 March, the FBI illuminated the compound with bright light in an effort to disrupt sleep. They also set up speakers around the compound, which blared recordings of pop music, chanting, jet planes, and even the screams of rabbits being slaughtered. It must have been awful to hear that all night, especially for the small children who were there. In an effort to block out the light and the noise, those inside the compound covered the windows and put mattresses and hay against the wall to try and block out the light and the noise. On 15 March, Stephen Douglas met with Supervisory Senior Resident Agent, SSRA, Byron Sage, and McLennan County Sheriff Jack Harwell for about an hour and agreed that they would continue with negotiations. On the 19th of March, Brad Branch and Kevin Wycliffe left the compound, and two days later, Victorine Hollingsworth, Annette Richards, Rita Riddle, Gladys Ottman, Sheila Martin, James Lawton, and Ophelia Santoya also left. Despite many promises, and even some people leaving the compound, David kept promising that they would all come out, but kept negating on this promise. The standoff had become a news media sensation. Channels from all over the US covered it, and even Oprah did an episode where she interviewed Robin and Janine Bunch during the standoff. Many days passed where David and Steve kept promising to come out, but did not. The FBI had hoped that with the followers in the compound not having access to electricity and water, they would buckle. But they lived off rainwater and had plenty of MREs which they had stockpiled, so they had enough rations to keep them going for a while. The followers were used to living a rougher lifestyle, so I think it may not have bothered them as much as the FBI thought it would. 
Eventually, on 29 March, Dick de Guerin, an attorney appointed by David's mother, was allowed to meet with him. Steve was also allowed to speak to his lawyer, Jack Zimmerman, in an unmonitored call. David and Steve's lawyers were allowed to meet with them on the compound, and after a few meetings over three days, the lawyers informed the FBI that David had agreed to leave the compound on either the 2nd or the 10th of April. The reason given for these two differing dates was because it was alleged that they wanted to celebrate Passover at the compound before they would leave. Just an interesting fact, Passover started on the 6th of April that year. The FBI called the compound on the 2nd of April to see if David and his followers would surrender. Steve answered the phone and stated that Dave was asking God to tell him. In a later conversation that same day, they were told that they would only come out after Passover. They also didn't come out on the 10th. Law enforcement was growing very impatient with David. In a final attempt to get the followers out, they agreed that David would be given a few days to write his message around the seven seals. They provided David with all of the typewriting equipment that he requested. David feverishly dictated for hours while Judy Schneider typed his words. Each time the FBI would call to check on the progress, they were met with the same answer, that David was still busy with it. On the 13th of April, a sign appeared from the window stating, Flames await, Isaiah 13. This chapter of the Bible is all about how God punishes Babylon. The FBI's patience had finally run out. The HRT met with the US Attorney General Janet Reno, who had been newly appointed in that position actually on the 1st of March of that year, and sought approval for an assault using CS gas, or as we know it, tear gas, at the compound. According to Lung.org, quote, In general, exposure to tear gas can cause chest tightness, coughing, a choking sensation, wheezing and shortness of breath, in addition to a burning sensation in the eyes, mouth and nose, blurred vision and difficulty swallowing. Tear gas can also cause chemical burns, allergic reactions and respiratory distress, end quote. Janet Reno informed President Bill Clinton of the goings-on and their plans, and he approved it. The FBI and the ATF had also consulted various psychological and religious experts during the raid. Most of them had said that it looked like David was willing to die for what he believed in. I think this may have led them to be more forceful in their approach, where maybe they shouldn't have been. Janet Reno approved the request and stated that it was to happen on the 19th of April. In her approval, it was stated that it may take around 48 hours as the gas was to be released into the compound gradually. On the 18th of April, tanks rolled onto the compound and they destroyed the cars there. Then, finally, on the 19th of April, 1993, on day 51 of the standoff, the assault began. At 5.55 a.m., armored combat engineering vehicles, or CEVs, started toward the compound. As this was happening, SSA Byron Sage called the compound and asked to speak to Steve. When Steve got to the phone, SSA Sage informed him that they were going to put tear gas into the building, but stated that it was not assault, as they would not be physically entering the building. Steve was so angered that he put the phone down, ripped the cable from the wall and threw the phone out of the window. Then SSA Sage began broadcasting a message to everyone in the compound over the sound system. Quote, we are in the process of placing tear gas into the building. This is not an assault. We are not entering the building. This is not an assault. Do not fire your weapons. If you fire, fire will be returned. Do not shoot. This is not an assault. The gas you smell is a non-lethal tear gas. This gas will temporarily render the building uninhabitable. Exit the compound now and follow these instructions. You are not to have anyone in the tower. The tower is off limits. No one is to be in the tower. Anyone observed to be in the tower will be considered to be an act of aggression and will be dealt with accordingly. If you come out now, you will not be harmed. Follow all instructions. Come out with your hands up. Carry nothing. Come out of the building. Walk up the driveway toward the double E Ranch Road. 
Walk toward the large red cross flag. Follow all instructions of the FBI agent in the Bradleys. Follow all instructions. You are under arrest. The standoff is over. We do not want to hurt anyone. Follow all instructions. This is not an assault. Don't fire any weapons. We do not want to hurt anyone. Gas will continue to be delivered until everyone is out of the building. End quote. Steve ordered everyone to get their gas masks on. Then, the CEVs breached the outer walls of the compound and started releasing the gas. In his book, David Thibodeau describes it as follows. Quote, Suddenly, a sickening crash sound reverberates through the entire structure, as if the building had been struck by a giant metal fist. End quote. Inside of the compound, the adults pull on their gas masks and wet towels to place over the noses and mouths of those children whose faces are too small for their masks. Some take refuge in the sturdy room that had been used as a cold room. Slowly over the next few hours, tear gas is poured into the compound, but no one comes out. At 9.10am, a banner is hung from one of the windows stating that they want their phone lines repaired. The CEVs continue to penetrate various sections of the building, pouring more tear gas in. One of these was the concrete walled room where the women and children were taking shelter. At 12.07pm, the HRT sees smoke coming from the kitchen area. Soon the entire compound is engulfed in flames. Nine adults manage to escape, four of which are severely burnt, one of which is carrying a computer disc with a 6,075-word partial manuscript from David. Again, there is contention around how the fire was started. Those in law enforcement state that it was purposefully started on orders from David. Those who had escaped the flames blame it on the tear gas, which some allege is known to be flammable. It was after 3 p.m. that afternoon, when the fire had finally burnt out. A few days later, when the rubble had cooled down, they began to look for the bodies. The next section is a bit rough and has some graphic descriptions of death of adults and children. Please skip over the next few seconds if you feel that you need to. It was found that David had been shot by Steve, who in turn shot himself. Some of the women and children had been found to have been buried alive under fallen rubble and had suffocated. Some of the followers were found to have died from smoke or carbon monoxide inhalation. It was found that some of the children had succumbed to cyanide poisoning as a result of the burning tear gas. At least 18 other people were found to have been shot, including 5 children under the age of 14, and one 3-year-old child was found to have been stabbed in the chest. All in all, 76 men, women and children lost their lives very tragically that day. Some were identified, but many have not been to this day. Those who were identified were David and Rachel Koresh, Stephen Judy Schneider, Ray Friesen, Floyd Hartman, Livingston Malcolm, Douglas Wayne Martin, Mark Wendell, Sonia Murray, Jennifer Andrade, James Riddle, Stephen and Philip Henry, Susan Benter, Yvette and Doris Fagan, Catherine Andrade, Alric Bennett, Rebecca Saipia, Novelette Hipsman, Niall Viega, Pablo Cohen, Lisa Marie Ferris, Mary Jean Borst, Martin Wayne, Michelle Jones, Joseph Juliet Audrey and Abigail Martinez, and Rosemary Morrison. There were also the unidentified John and Jane Doe's, 41 in total ranging from infancy to approximately 50 years of age. I cannot even fathom what went through their minds as this was happening. My heart is broken for those poor little children and those unnamed victims. Joanne Viega, one of the children that had initially been released, stated later in an interview that while she was watching the siege and the flames, she was not shocked at all. In fact, she found it normal, as David had predicted that it would happen that way. I really hope that despite the utter tragic way that these souls had perished, they made their way to their version of heaven and are at peace now. 
Some of those who had gotten out were immediately taken into custody, subsequently arrested and indicted. Fatter, who was not at the compound at the time, was also taken to trial. In total, 11 members were taken to trial. None of them were found guilty of murder, but seven were found guilty of aiding and abetting the involuntary manslaughter of federal agents. President Bill Clinton and Janet Reno took a lot of criticism after the fact as to how the situation was handled. Emma Paul Bishop Roden, the ex-wife of George Roden, tried to lay claim to the compound after the siege, but she was unsuccessful. Even through all of the sadness and sometimes obvious lies, there were still and are still to this day people who believe in David and his message. There are even those that firmly believe that he was the Messiah, that the Waco massacre was part of the breaking of the seals, and that David would rise again and come back to them. There were numerous investigations into what happened on that fateful day and in the days before, but each time the blame was placed on David Koresh. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle of it all, and that mistakes were made on both sides. The compound is now visited by tourists who can walk around and see what is left there after the siege. Two years later, to the day, on 19 April 1995, a young man named Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. He cited one of the reasons was the massacre at Waco. That is the end of my covering of the Branch Davidians. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavour AV and tell them that I sent you. I just want to thank my UK listeners for all of their support. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.